In 1999, the internet's first viral video revealed just how fragile the web really was. A two-minute trailer for Star Wars Episode One. Millions hit play, and the web collapsed in real time. Only a few sites survived, running on a mysterious network most people had never heard of. Ten years later, that same network became the center of an FBI investigation. And by 2021, a single line of code inside it made half the web vanish overnight. This is the story of how a one pixel experiment quietly rebuilt the internet. The Hidden Network, a secret history of content delivery networks. By 1995, the web was already straining. Each website relied on a single origin server to feed every visitor, and the popular ones simply couldn't keep up with demand. At MIT, Tim Berners-Lee saw this coming. The creator of the web had already watched his own invention slow under its own weight. In meetings, he warned that if the web kept growing like this, it would fail. He challenged his colleagues to find a fundamentally better way to deliver content. The question wasn't how to build faster computers, it was how to outsmart distance itself. The people who took that challenge seriously would end up building the hidden system that the internet now depends on. Tom Layton was a quiet MIT mathematician who specialized in optimization. Danny Lewin, one of his graduate students, was an energetic former Israeli commando. Together, they took Berners-Lee's challenge and turned it into a research project. Danny Lewin's key idea was a routing method called consistent hashing, a way to direct users to different servers without overloading any single one. He once described it half-jokingly as a pathetic idea but it's my idea. However, outside their lab, no one seemed to care. Their proposal was dismissed by MIT's $50,000 business competition, and their paper was rejected by journals. Still, they kept going. In 1998, they launched Akamai, licensing MIT's patents and building a distributed network of servers designed to put data closer to users. The name Akamai meant smart in Hawaiian, and their first office was small. However, the concept wasn't. Replicate content everywhere, and let math decide the fastest route to users. What began as an academic project was about to become the backbone of the modern web. Their first live test of the technology was invisible to the public. In February 1999, a single hidden pixel on Disney's website quietly traveled through Akamai's network. The pixel loaded instantly from nearby servers to the user, instead of a distant origin. It proved the math behind their invention worked. Weeks after this initial test came the real challenge. ESPN streamed March Madness online, and Lucasfilm released the trailer for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. Millions tried to watch at once, and for most users, the web simply couldn't keep up. However, for those reaching sites that were powered by Akamai's distributed servers, it worked flawlessly. Akamai's edge machines rerouted traffic to the nearest copy of the file, absorbing demand without interruption. Within three weeks of this event, more than six million people downloaded the Star Wars trailer successfully. Steve Jobs even called it the biggest download event in internet history. It was also the birth of the viral video, an audience of millions sharing a digital moment that didn't break the system. A one pixel test had just proved a new idea, that the internet could scale, that a handful of servers placed in the right spots could keep the whole thing running. After that, the word spread. Everyone wanted in. The next few years would turn this academic experiment into a gold rush and test whether the web's new backbone could survive the chaos it created. After the Star Wars moment, investors flooded in everyone seemed to want their own version of Akamai. New content delivery network startups appeared almost overnight. Sandpiper, Digital Island, Speedera, each promising faster, cheaper, smarter delivery of content. In 1999, Sandpiper was acquired for over a billion dollars in stock by Digital Island, a company that claimed to run the world's largest content network. Dozens of others raised huge valuations without ever turning a profit. The market believed that speed itself was the product. By early 2000, Akamai's stock price had soared to a $350 price per share. Then the dot-com bubble burst. The illusion collapsed 
and Digital Island's billion-dollar valuation dropped 98%. Even Akamai's share price fell from $345 to under $5. Most content delivery network competitors disappeared. However, not long after this competitor wipeout, by 2002, a serious player was back competing for market share, Spidera Networks, a Silicon Valley startup led by Ajit Gupta. He promised a cheaper, faster alternative to Akamai and began poaching clients. What followed was one of the nastiest feuds in early internet history. Akamai accused Spidera of stealing trade secrets and breaking into a password-protected customer database. The FBI raided Spidera's offices as part of the investigation. Employees were questioned and systems were seized for forensic review. Gupta fired back publicly, accusing Akamai of trying to win in the courtroom what they couldn't in the marketplace. The rivalry forced both companies to innovate under pressure. Faster routing, better caching, and the first steps towards securing data, not just delivering it. By 2005, the fight ended the only way it could. Akamai bought Spidera for $130 million, settling all claims. Gupta called it a Shakespearean feud finally put to rest. Danny Lewin had designed Akamai's network to prevent one thing, collapse under sudden demand. On the morning of September 11, 2001, Lewin boarded American Airlines Flight 11. When hijackers took control, reports say he tried to intervene. As the attacks unfolded, millions rushed online for news. Within minutes, CNN.com, a former Akamai customer, crashed under the surge of traffic. By midday, CNN engineers called Akamai for help. Paul Sagan, Akamai's president at the time, told his team, we have to do what Danny would do. They reconnected CNN systems to Akamai's distributed network, spreading the load across hundreds of servers. Within hours, the site came back online. Not perfectly, but steady enough to reach millions who were desperate for information. The same tragedy that took Lewin's life had also proven the value of his idea. A network designed to survive chaos had done exactly that. On the day its creator was lost, the invention fulfilled its promise. By 2005, the web had become video. YouTube launched, and anyone could upload a clip that millions might see. Content delivery networks made it possible. Akamai and companies like Limelight carried the early weight, caching videos closer to viewers so playback could start immediately. In 2007, Netflix stopped mailing DVDs and began streaming. At first, Netflix rented capacity from Akamai, and within five years, Netflix's traffic made up nearly a third of North America's internet bandwidth. To survive this historic surge in traffic, Netflix built OpenConnect, its own content delivery network. Netflix engineers shipped racks of preloaded caching servers directly to internet service providers, sometimes literally boxing up and mailing servers across oceans. Each rack stored the most watched titles locally, so viewers never waited for a distant server. It worked. The model spread, and streaming wasn't a product anymore. It was infrastructure. The system that once kept news alive on 9-11 was now the reason the internet played without a pause. Until 2008, content delivery networks were for corporations that could pay tens of thousands of dollars a month. But then Amazon launched CloudFront, pay only for what you use. Suddenly, a small developer could reach a global audience for a few dollars. In 2010, Cloudflare went further. It offered a content delivery network tier for free. Its founders built the early network from secondhand machines, driving city to city to pick up donated servers. Within a year, millions of sites signed on. This shift changed the shape of the web. Now anyone could make a fast, globally reachable site. Speed was no longer the privilege of large companies. It was the default. As content delivery networks spread across the world, they took on a new role. Not just delivering the web, but defending it. In 2013, a volunteer group called Spam House, which helped internet providers block email spam, came under attack. A web hosting company it had blacklisted retaliated by flooding the internet with fake traffic. A wave of traffic so huge, it slowed connections around the world. 
a young content delivery network company called Cloudflare stepped in to protect Spam House and successfully absorbed the attack, keeping most of the internet online. However, those same networks that gave the web strength also made it fragile. On June 8, 2021, a software bug inside another content delivery network fastly rippled outwards after a routine update. Within seconds, sites like Reddit, Amazon, CNN, and Spotify went offline. Newsrooms resorted to posting stories on Google Docs, and governments pushed out plain text pages to share health alerts with its citizens. This wasn't a hack, but a small mistake in one company's code that briefly erased a large part of the internet. For an hour, the system built to keep the web resilient did exactly the opposite. From a trailer that nearly brought down the web to billion-dollar companies shipping servers across oceans to shave milliseconds off load times, the history of content delivery networks is a small part of the story that made today's internet possible. Thanks for watching this episode of Offline Museum. If you want more stories about hidden systems and the history of the internet, subscribe for more.